What's going on, guys? You're listening to David F. Haas Podcast. I'm in the studio today with Maria Gerlando. Oh, I got it. <laughs> uh, Miss Canada, 2018. I was lucky enough to have her at uh, one of my retreats out at Lugo Vida. Um, and she was telling me she, that she's now a pageant coach. And I always love talking to coaches because uh, we gain so much insight as coaches into what's going on with everybody. Um, and we can we can break apart people's limitations is really what coaching is kind of all about. And so uh, you have like a really interesting story about how you got into the whole pageant game and uh, how to went to school for nursing and decided to make a career shift after all that. So thanks for coming on. I'm so happy to be here. Thanks for having me. Yeah, I think it's gonna be an interesting conversation. I, th- I think the the thing that drew me to you know the story your story is is one that you've built a career out of like um, like a, this like a really this really niche market and you know it, it's like we live in the world today where you can do whatever you want mm-hmm. and uh, you're like a testament to that because you have this business where you're coaching people on how to be competitive within pageants is that essentially what you're doing now yeah i pretty much consider pageantry like a sport almost like an olympic athlete if they want to place on the podium they're going to have a coach a team that's going to support them not only with the strategy and skills to get there but with the mindset too so exactly the same thing but in the world of pageantry which is admittedly not as big in canada but around the world it is massive and growing and it it is big here we just are a really good kept secret i think yeah. And as I think many people are coming to this realization that it's like you get coached or taught your whole entire life up to a point and then you stop. And so anyone that wants to achieve anything in any level, the be- always the best advice is, that I've always found is like go to someone that's already done it and, you know, learn from their experience. And, and that's why I think coaching is becoming, you know, more mainstream these days is because people recognize it's like it's just a, a faster path from point A to point B if you can go to somebody that's already already done it. Is, is that what you're finding, I'm assuming, with the clients that you're grabbing? Yeah, absolutely. Especially even when I joined, I noticed that I was getting to the end of my education and I thought, well, what's next? No one's going to tell me what to do. And so I was able to kind of guide and coach myself through that, being very self-aware that I am. But I find that a lot of women and people just don't have that self-awareness and they don't have that support. And why struggle through life alone when there are so many incredible resources and people who can help you navigate the uncertainty in life and really have a life of meaning but i think some people don't realize it's out there yeah yeah definitely and like one of the things that that you know that's really interesting to me is that that you were able to do which a lot of people get trapped in is that you you went to school for nursing right and Mm -hmm. so like nursing is like no joke of a program Mm -hmm. right (laughs) i would never go back yeah and so um you you go to school you spend all this time and somewhere along the way during that you you get into pageants and which is a different approach like most people are doing pageants as kids now. Did you do that as well? Or? No, not oh. at all. And I have a lot of young young gals come to me that want my support. I work with more older women, but I was 21 when I joined. And I think in my 300 person class program, I think I knew one other person who had dabbled in coaching in some, or dabbled in pageantry in some way. So it wasn't around me in any way. And I really found... I say we found each other, but I really found the industry because I was looking to fulfill something bigger than just graduating, getting a nursing job and kind of calling it a day, calling it a life. I wanted to have something so much more that my life stood for. And you know, lo and behold, my journey was through pageants, but I know that's not going to be that way for everybody, but right. that was how I did it. Well, and I just because I'm just because I'm interested in person, I was like, what drew you to pageants? It's like, it's because especially because you are right in Canada, it's not like in America, they have Miss America, and it's this huge thing, and Donald Trump is the sponsor, and all this stuff. And and but in Canada, we don't have like that big of a presence. Like it's not like as mainstream as it is, and that's pretty much for everything in Canada. You know, like our our mm-hmm. sports aren't as big, uh, high school sports aren't as big, that kind of thing. But so, what was it about pageantry that captured your attention? Yeah, I was in actually my third year of nursing when I took a look at myself. My friends and I actually took a last minute trip to Mexico because that's what you do on spring break to have some fun. And when I got back, I was looking through the photos and I remember I was sitting in my room and I was flipping through and I saw a photo of a girl on a beach and I thought, this is a terrible photo. Like this should be burned. And I truly didn't realize that it was me in the photo, just the way I was standing, the way I had looked. I really didn't recognize myself in the photo I had taken when I should be on spring break and having so much fun. And I realized I didn't know myself. I wasn't happy. You could clearly tell I didn't feel confident and beautiful in who I was. And in that moment, I said, no more. I don't know what Maria is supposed to look like in life, but this is not it. And so for about two months, I pursued this 
venture of finding myself, of discovering who Maria was going to be through daily practices like self-care, going for a walk, cooking, just different random things. I Googled it, of course, because that's what we do when we don't know what we (laughs) need to do in life. And I was scrolling on Facebook one day about two months later, and I saw the opening for a pageant in my area. It was the Miss Via Italia pageant, which I don't know that they run anymore, Mm. but I saw that I was eligible for the age and the date. And so I reached out to the director. We had a quick conversation and I was in. That's wild. Yeah. So, because it's just so interesting to me that you made this connection. Like, I mean, what a, what a, a moment of awareness is to kind of see a picture of yourself. And actually that happens a lot with people in pictures. It's like, for some reason, when you look in the mirror every day, you don't see it, but then you see a picture and you're like, whoa, like, uh, I look really sad there or I look really overweight there or whatever it may be, you know? And so you're, you're picking up on like not having the confidence and everything just from a photo, which is awesome. And then uh, in order to like tap into that, you know, sense of self, you kind of go down this road of, of pageantry, which is, I think is so, is so unique and, um, kind of like an interesting kind of way to go. But I think, I think one of the things that is important about like pageantry is, is, is similar to like, let's say like martial arts or something is it helps build confidence. And like, I can just tell, like, even when you just kind of like walk in here, I met you at the Lingo Vita one day, but, um, you know, you have like this confidence or uh, about yourself, you have this posture, you know, uh, this openness. And so it's like, oh, okay, cool. Well, if that's what pageantry g- gave you and could give to, to give to other people and everyone has their different avenue or path. But I mean, for you, it was pageantry and, and it helped you uncover, um, you know, some things that were blocking you kind of from like living, living your best life. So why don't we talk a little bit about that if you're open to it? Of you know, course. yeah, like, like, you know, you've had these, these awarenesses, you know, kind of from this moment of like seeing that photo. And so like, what were, what were the main things you think that were like really limiting you from being who you are today? The first thing was my environment. I was conditioned to go to school, get good grades, occasionally go out and hang out with friends on the weekend. And that was all I knew. I would go home and then I knew at the end of four years, I would get a job with a safe career. And I didn't have people around me who were entrepreneurs. My parents are both hardworking people. They've always supported me, but very mainstream, go to school, get a job. Same thing with the friends I was hanging around with. It was, we're going to go study. We're not going to, you know, we might hang out on the weekend. We might go out, but we're not doing anything else other than that. The people around me didn't know about community service or anything. So that was one really big thing. We are a product of our environment, of the things we surround ourselves with. So I really didn't know any better because I didn't see anybody else doing the thing that I wanted to be doing. So that was more on a physical level, I would say. Yeah. And then internally i will say i've always been a really confident person in general but i think that i was limited because i didn't have a bigger vision for myself i really didn't know that i could be an international speaker that i could run my own business and you know once i started having those goals yes of course mindset things came up like can i actually do this am i good enough will people think i'm pretty and want me to win but it was really about not even having an awareness of what my dream or queen life would look like that you know had i been taught so much sooner i might have taken this journey you know before i was 21 but internally i really didn't have a vision for myself that was bigger than go to school get a job have a family and that's it yeah which is so huge uh, there's a um, what's that guy that hosts family Feud? i can't remember his name steve harvey steve harvey there's a quote that he's like kind of like a motivational speaker and stuff as well and he has this one quote about um it's, a, it's all about like the pot that you grew up in right and so if you grew up in the pot of go to school, get a job, that's kind of like, you know, as big as you can grow. Uh, but if you start, you know, looking to other pots and then you, and if you grew up in the pot of, you know, if you, if you grew up in um, Palo Alto, it's like your idea of like what it might be possible <laughs> might be like to build a hundred million dollar company and this, cause that's the pot that you grew up in. And so, um, yeah, I think that's what you're kind of articulating there is, is that once you realize that you were in a pot, you you then started to look oh well, what other pots could there be mm-hmm. and uh yeah so for whatever reason that photo was like kind of like the catalyst of that and i'm guessing well let, let's well, before we get into how you're helping your clients let's just talk about kind of like some of your success so you have this strength of co- confidence has kind of been with you your whole life mm-hmm. is it, where, where did that come from i think it came from my dad yeah. he is a soccer coach so he has the coaching background in a way as well and just he's always encouraging me to pursue different things. I remember going to him in grade school and asking if I could do a basketball camp, which is criminal. I should not have been allowed to sign up for that in any way. But 
he, him and my mom, of course, both said, yes, go for it. They never thought that me wanting to try different things, whether it was knitting and buying me knitting looms or signing up for a basketball camp, nothing was a crazy idea or something out of reach. And they've always supported me to say yes to different things that I enjoyed. So we think that that just reinforced me getting to try out different things in my life. Yeah, yeah, that's amazing. Well, what's your what's your background like, like ethnic background? I'm 50% Italian and 50% Croatian. Mom will get mad if we don't mention the Croatian side <laughs> of it. But the Italian really does take over. And me and oh, my yeah. dad's the Italian one, so we definitely have those similarities. Right, yeah. My, my wife's 100% Italian, so I know all about, yeah. about Italians. The culture. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, for sure. And I mean, Italians are a little bit in that. like, uh, um, They kind of have that confidence about them, right? Mm -hmm. I don't know where that comes from. Probably years of... Uh, you know, building things out of stone or something. Mm -hmm. I can, I can, I can, I can pour some concrete and, and make that happen, right? Yeah. So yeah, that's amazing. So you, so you find this internal strength, and you're like, I have confidence, and you're recognizing that part of uh, pageantry is this the confidence that that it takes to win, right? And I think is really what it comes down to, a, like a belief. Yeah. And so then you you enter this first one, and then um, and then you kind of had success success from there. So why don't you just kind of walk us through that journey a little bit? And it's funny because I remember that first day I got off the phone with the director for it was a one day pageant. It was free to join, like a very simple, very low scale. But I was shaking with nerves and I went to go tell my family, hey, you guys, I, I signed up for a pageant thinking they're going to think I'm crazy. Like, what is this? You're 21. Why are you doing this? And they were just like, OK, well, let us know when the date is and we'll be there. And so that's what I mean, just that that not questioning or doubting what I wanted to do. So they all showed up there to an outdoor pageant that had over, I think, 500 people in the audience because it was the the Carousel of Nations and it was during the Italian festival. And I ended up placing top three and I won the Miss Congeniality Award, which is voted upon by the other women. So my first pageant, I six months prior, I had no idea what pageants were. I'd never thought about them. And I was in the top three when there were some other incredibly amazing and beautiful women on those stages and I remember thinking I'm up here what's going on this is kind of backwards in my mind and it didn't register till the next day that I lost like technically okay I, I it was top three but I didn't get the crown I know the woman who did but I didn't even realize it it didn't feel like a loss it was so excited and I was so ready so I took that ambition that momentum and I entered Miss Tecumseh which is our local pageant it usually is held at the corn fest and this is a bigger pageant, though. It's $50 to enter. So there's more to it, clearly. Right. And it took a little bit more to compete, more elements of it. But I told myself, Maria, you're you're totally going to do this. There's You just were top three in this first pageant. You didn't even know this, and you're a competitor. So I learned all of the elements, went on to the stage of Miss Tecumseh, where you get a scholarship, you get to host fundraisers for a charity of choice. You're kind of known as like a local celebrity in a way that you get to go to different events and... I, on, this was, oh my gosh, eight years ago, I received the photogenic award. So six months prior, again, I saw a photo of myself that totally changed my life, that I did not recognize me. And I won the photogenic award for a headshot that was taken of me, which was in itself a shock. Mm -hmm. And I won the best interview award for being able to articulate myself in a panel of judges. And I won Miss Tecumseh 2016. Wow. So that alone just needed a, its moment in such a short amount of time. And I really do think it's because of the inner work that I was doing, the self-reflection. But my goodness, again, it's been eight years now. After that, I went on to compete at Miss Canada because I thought, well, if I was able to do Miss to come see, I hosted three different fundraisers. I raised over $5,000 for the Sick Kids Foundation, uh, close to $5,000. I got to do different events and community related things. I was having a ball and I was ready for what was next. So that led me to joining Miss Canada, which is a about a five day competition in Montreal, Quebec. Obviously, a lot more to it, a lot more international and national opportunities and show up there just like a big old ball of energy, just excited pretty much to have the opportunity. But going in with the mindset that I'm here to show them why I'm the best fit and what I'm here to do. And I think that's something that has always been a strong suit of mine. I find that, and maybe you have because you see this in your coaching too, but so many people focus on the steps. What do I have to do? What do I have to wear? What do I have to walk in or say? And I've always thought about what I'm going to do when I get the crown. And I've always led with that. 
And so on a stage with 27 other women who are, you know, former queens themselves who have done other accomplishing things, I was being crowned Miss Canada 2018 right before my 23rd birthday. I won and two hours later, I turned 23 and the entire organization was singing to me, happy birthday. Wow. That was insane. And those are just the first three pageants I competed in. I mean, we... I'm sure we're going to talk about all the rest, but that allowed me to go internationally and represent Canada several times where I placed top three. I was able to travel to the Philippines. I could go on and on, but I want to just really emphasize the fact that it started because I've always asked myself, what do I want to do with this title? Why me? What am I bringing to this? There are other women. They're incredible. They're going to do amazing things, but why me? Why am I here? And I think that's why, even though I haven't been competing since I was young, even though I don't have a ton of experience. And for those of you who can't see me, I'm five foot two. Like I'm really short on stage next to all of these other women. I've still been able to stand out and win some of the most prestigious titles, not only around Canada, but around the world as well. Yeah. And do you think though, like, like how much do you think, and I, I think part of what your your strategy is there of like connecting to the outcome and connecting to the emotion and, and the uh, like, you know, this is something I teach in coaching is like, I, I have this saying, it's like, figure out what it is you want to do and then ask yourself, how is that going to make you feel once you're there? And I think that's part of, part of your process by doing that, as I was saying, like what, what's going to happen after the wins, you're already putting yourself into that spot where you're connecting to the emotion of all, of all you, and you start, you start believing it. Right. And you start like really thinking like, we're really believing that you're going to have this success. And then once you believe it, you achieve it. And so that's, that's seems to be like what is kind of happening and, for you and I like the, the fact that you said that um, people get so so connected to the process and and this is a lot of what I help people you know snap out of is is that is once you set a line with an intention the you will just be pulled by that intention and and if you trying any, as soon as you try and bring control in is actually when you you get out of that alignment right because you're trying to control it you you don't even know how it will unfold and like you're you're like a a gleaming example of that, right? As it's like, you know, you, you align with an attention, an intention of like, uh, you want something more for yourself. Right. And then once you just you know, allow yourself to be pulled consciously or unconsciously by that intention. And because of that, it shows up as like getting the title of Miss Canada, which is like probably something that wasn't even like on your radar, kind of, I'm guessing when you first started out. And so even pageantry might not have even been on your radar, but you just had this intention of like, Hey, I want to look within and see what's going on. And then, then you start seeing opportunities on how you could fulfill the intention of, I want to feel better about myself and whatever. And then that's how you kind of get aligned with uh, pageantry. So yeah, it's about like, mm -hmm. about not worrying so much about the one, two, three, you got to do this to kind of get to a goal. And I'm guessing you're, you're coaching, you know, your clients to, to kind of step out of that same, uh, because I'm assuming and I'm, I'm, I'm making an assumption here, but most people that get into pageants are very like, I need to do this, do this, do this, do this, do this. And they get, they get really trapped in the, the X's and O's of it all. And, and maybe, uh, not so connected to the belief. Uh, and I'm guessing you're also probably helping them get out of their, their limiting beliefs that are, that are blocking them. So why don't you kind of just expand on like how, well, let's do two things. Uh, first, why don't you talk about like the leap that you made into this like coaching thing? Cause I think that's super interesting and then we'll get into how you're helping your clients break down beliefs because yeah. i think that I, i'd be interested to get your insight on that yeah of course so after winning miss canada that's when i really started turning heads because you win one time and people think okay lucky shot right but winning two times back to back and being miss canada now people are looking and going okay this isn't luck you know what you're doing mm -hmm. so i started out by having women in my local area reach out to me and say you're doing really well I have been trying this for years. The woman who first came to me had competed, I believe, either for seven years or seven times and had never placed in a competition. And she said, I want your help. I want you to coach me. I'm pretty sure I charged her $200 for like four months of coaching, unlimited sessions. I said, I don't know if I can help you, but let's just see. Let's just try this out. And we worked on everything from why she wanted to win, which is something she'd never thought about. And she was like, oh, I didn't really think about that, which... That's what we do, right? We think about why are you actually doing this? What do you want? And we build out your entire strategy, your brand, your performance from there. And after a seven year or seven time 
dry streak. She placed top five at a national pageant where there were other national title holders there competing against her. She was placing higher than them. And I actually think that she could have won. She absolutely still could have. But, you know, mm. after never competing and then the only real thing that was different was our coaching together. Not only did I know it worked, but I loved it. I love the process and seeing her light up and step into the queen that she would be even before she won. So started with just local gals, you know, supporting them in person. And then eventually I built up my online coaching page on Instagram and women started finding me and reaching out to me to coach them around, you know, different different places around the world, different places across Canada. And so that's when it really transformed from being in-person coaching to virtual coaching yeah. and supporting women who wanted to build a vision for what the title would look like and for themselves and helping them consistently put that into practice. And the biggest difference I will say between myself and between a lot of other coaches is I started seeing other, co I didn't know coaches existed to be completely honest. Again, I was, this industry is so new and it's growing. And even to people who are aware of it, there's still so much that we don't know about it. And I started seeing other coaches and I realized that they only offered single sessions. Like you pay for one session for one hour and then you rebook whenever you choose. And that first client I took on, even though it was, you know, peanuts of the amount I charged her, I was so certain in myself that one session ain't going to do this. Yep. It's going to take time. And that's something that I've always been rooted in, that the way I competed was different than every other delegate. That's why I won several times successfully without having experience or putting in as much effort. And so I thought to myself, my coaching is going to be different than the way everybody else does it because it's going to take more than one hour for you to transform. It's like, do you want to work on your interview and your runway? Or do you want to become the person who can win no matter who else is on stage? That's what I help women do. Yeah. <laughs> Amazing. I mean, just as I hear you talk, it's like, I think so many women would benefit from that just in their regular day-to-day -day life. Mm -hmm. You know, and it's like recognizing like who you want to become. I think, I think like a lot of people, uh, this is especially true you know, it was for me, it's like, if I wasn't really cr crystal clear on where I was going, you kind of always get uh, cloudy results. Right. And so, um, what I like what you're doing though, is you're getting people connected to the belief and the becoming, right. And it's like, th there's all this stuff on there, out there about manifesting and all of this, but it's really all manifesting really is, is truly believing it before you achieve it. Right. And, and, and it's backwards. It's like, if money is going to make you happy, then it's like, well, let, let's start solving for why you're not happy now. And once you start becoming happy, then you get the money, right? And so you're doing the same thing with your clients. It's like, well, why do you want to win this title? Like, how how are you gonna how are you gonna feel when you are when you are wearing the crown, and you're getting them connected to that belief? And once you have the belief, it's like, it's almost pretty much done. The other the other question I had for you was, you said you were you were doing it different than everybody else, and, and you applied that to your coaching. And and I and I, I I agree with that. It's like. This is actually for anyone else listening out there saying we'll get coaching and anything. It's like it took you however many years to create the programs and things that are protecting you and limiting you. It's like it's not not that it's not possible to undo it in one one session. Like you could have some great clarity in one session, but you know, most of the time it's it's gonna take some digging to to really begin to to change these programs. So yeah, I definitely think it's I think you're bang on with your your guidance there to do more than once, but when you said about the competing, you were doing it differently. Like, well, one is you, you have this belief and you're tuning into that, but what, what else was there? Is there any other, you know, things that you, you think that you were doing so much differently than everybody else? I was having a lot of fun. Mm. I was just so happy to be in this awareness and in this embodiment of I can do anything because once I, what I call it as I had that wake up moment, once I woke up and I realized how much better life got to be when I got to decide what I want to do, where I want to go. I was just so excited to try out different things. And one mantra that's always stuck with me is like, I'm always winning. It's like, I'm either going to win the crown or something so much better is coming. And so I was able to really reap the rewards of just the process because I wasn't so attached to getting the crown. Because I remember what it was like several years ago when all I would do was go to nursing school, go home, study, maybe go out with friends. And that was it. And it was so dry and unfulfilling and so whether I was at the very last place in that competition on that stage it was still better than never having this awareness of I get to decide what my life looks like and I think again that perspective alone 
sometimes people look at me and they try and calculate, what did she do? Okay, she had this platform, she wore this color dress, maybe that's what I should do. And I'm like, but you don't realize the awareness and realization that I've had. You can do, and that's why I say, you can do all the things I do. You can wear the same dresses, you could have the same, what we call them as a platform initiative, which is like your community service focus that you create. And I was like, you can do the exact same thing I'm doing, but you're not going to do it the way I do it because I have this connection with myself. And the best thing for you to do is to find that for you. Don't try and replicate what you think works or doesn't because all the strategies work. Every platform, every just anything can work, but you're the one who's going to make it work. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, that's that's it for sure. You took the words right out of my mouth mm -hmm. when you're talking about like not being attached to the outcome. It's like, it's like, when you don't care whether you get it or not, and I don't always use the word don't care, but like when you're not attached to the outcome is really what it comes down to. It's like, then that's when that thing just comes flowing into your life. And it's, it's that, that attachment to the outcome that creates the stress and the anxiety and the overthinking. And the, then the more you start thinking about it, the, the more you start um, shifting, uh, controlling, blocking, you know, all of these things. And so, yeah, I think you're bang on. It's like, that's why you're doing it better than everybody else because you weren't attached to the outcome. You were having fun, you know, and you had, I think you also had like a bigger, a bigger why. It wasn't just about winning. It was about, uh, you know, connecting to this higher version of yourself, you know, your true self. And so uh, with that, with that intention, it's like, you, know, you just get into like alignment. Yeah. Mm -hmm. What, what did it take to like, to make the lead? Did you, did you finish nursing school or you, you finished nursing school? Did you get a nursing job? Or? I did. So I finished, I graduated with Dean's Honor Roll. Wow. So I'll go to show how studious I was. <laughs> and it actually took me about six months to even start looking for a job because I had just found this new found love for life until eventually I thought, okay, maybe we should get a nursing job. So I worked in a nursing home for about three years until the virus hit. And I decided, whoa, no, I need a change. I need something different. And this is sort of when coaching and nursing overlapped. But anytime anybody would ask me, I would say, nope, like I'm a nurse. That's it. Nope, I'm a nurse. And I took a lot of pride in that. And when people would ask me about my coaching, I was almost kind of ashamed. It was like, oh, no, like that's only for fun. I can't do that until it was probably in 2021. I had actually won an international title for Canada, which for those of you listening, you don't have to know anything about pageants, but Canadians winning international titles is like an asteroid hitting Earth. Like it just rarely happens again, because of the environment we have, of because probably some of the limitations we put on ourselves. But again, I had gone on and won this, you know, I call it the trifecta, right? A local, a national, and international title, something that most women will never even win one competition. And I had won in total four out of the eight that I competed in. And so coaching started getting a little bit more serious and women started coming to me from all different places and ways of life. And I made a really big look. Again, I had to look at myself in the mirror and I said, I don't like being a full-time nurse. I like nursing. I enjoy it. It gives me the skills, the authority when it comes to my audience of who I am, but it's not what I want to do full-time. It's not what I want to do five days a week for the rest of my life. And so first I had to get honest with myself because it's kind of like what we say, if you don't know where you're going, any path will get you there or not, but mm. you're not clear and you're going to get cloudy results. So I had to get honest with myself. And the biggest thing I had to do was get honest with the people around me. And that was hard for them. That was hard for mom and dad to realize, oh, wait, you don't want to be a nurse? What do you mean? Like, you have to be a nurse. It was kind of like that. But I'm very thankful that they didn't have to believe in the dream, but they trusted me. And I said, I'm always going to make sure I'm taken care of. I'm a smart person. I'm going to make sure I can work it out. I'm not just going to put my entire life in jeopardy to you know, help women win some crowns, which I think is what they thought, mm -hmm. what they see in it. And I made a goal at the beginning of this year. I wrote down on my agenda on August 31st, 2023, we are not going to have a nursing job. Now, I still do work as a nurse occasionally because I do enjoy parts of it. But it was in June that I officially told my, my manager that I was not going to be working full time. And the biggest thing that it took was really me just setting my soul on fire and saying, we've done all of this already. I've traveled around the world. I've won things like cruises and scholarships. It's like, is that it, Maria? Is that all you're going to let yourself be? Or are you going to let yourself fully like set yourself free and show yourself what you're capable of? Because if anyone can do it, it's you. And so it really took that 
deep dig belief, like a new level of belief I never even knew I had to fully be able to do it and have the people around me see that not only can I do it, but it's possible. And mm. now my parents are watching my lives. They say my different sayings in our community. Like I say, chin up, crown on. And my dad will call me and say, Maria, put your chin up and put your crown on. And mm. again, like the people around you, it, it, they're so vital to your growth, right? They're so vital, but it's also important to realize that you have to decide. Nobody else around you can decide. Nobody else can push you for it more than you have to. Because even with the people I love most, not fully getting it, I didn't need them to get it, but I had to get me. I've got to back myself on my dream. Yeah. And, and I, I mean, that's so, so critical. I think it's so important for so many people to hear because the people that are closest to us are, they're so influential on our lives. Like they can say like one thing and it can pl completely derail us. And just because of the closeness and connection that we have to them. And, and most of it is kind of like subconscious. So if you're not paying attention to how much influence they actually have, you could, you could wake up one day 30 years down the road in a nursing career or, or whatever that may be and be like, I, this is not even what I wanted to do. I wanted to sing or dance or whatever that may be. And, you know, and so, um, I think that that's so huge for you to be able to, to make that connection. Like, so like, I know you kind of already answered this. You've always, you, you feel like you've always had some self-awareness and, and these things, and, but like, you know, most people face with, you know, going to school, you know, you put all this time and energy, like nursing, I said, again, is tough, like a tough program and uh, there's money involved in there and expectation of family and especially coming from a family, like go to work, get a job and they have that, that's what you're supposed to do. And like, how did you break through all of that resistance? You know, it's like, um, that, like maybe just even like, sure, you, you have this, this underlying, like I can do it, but I'm sure there was moments of like the really questioning, like, can I do this? It was like, did you go through that that time? Yes, yeah. all of the time. And those feelings and thoughts don't just go away now either, but I know how to handle and navigate them so much more. So two things that come up. One is that I have a fiance right now. I'm getting married this year. And he has been so shockingly supportive. He's been with me since I started competing, since my first title, been together over seven years. And he was the one saying to me of January last year, like, Maria, you can do it right now. We're good. You can do it right now. So by the time I finally was ready on my own terms in June, he was like, yep, I already told you and who <laughs> could have done this. Like to have someone that supportive and believe because, you know, I believed in myself, but I thought, well, if I actually do this, then I actually have to make it happen. And what if I can't? And all of these fears come up. So to have him be so unshakably supportive was crucial. And unfortunately, I don't think that's something a lot of women or people have in their life is someone who does support you on that level and his family background like they're latin american they're hispanic so not not much more supportive entrepreneurship belief on that side but he's been so supportive and then another thing and it's so vital and i'm not just saying this because you and i are both coaches but i have been actively investing in pa not in pageant coaching in coaching for myself um probably since before the pandemic mm -hmm. just being in different spaces working with different one-on-one -on -one coaches and bouncing off different emotions and feelings and really being able to upgrade my own emotional intelligence about how I'm feeling on these things. And I don't know that I would have been able to do that. So even writing the date down, that was a coach and I that were co-creating that together and being in a space where I was with another mentor and she used the term set your soul on fire. And that's what I realized I wasn't doing. I was still attaching to my identity, being a nurse and working part-time and full-time in a nursing job that didn't set my soul on fire. So being with these other people who were doing the things I wanted to be doing, I didn't have that in my life. Finding the spaces and putting myself in the communities that I wanted to be in normalized the actions that I wanted to take. Because I thought people are in businesses all the time. You can be a full-time coach. But the biggest block, I think, was can I be a full-time pageant coach? Because I don't know that anyone was doing that. But I just kept telling myself, like, if other women can, I can too. And getting the support from the people who were full-time coaches in their own way was instrumental in helping me actually take the leap and do the thing. Yeah. You want to be around the people that are doing the thing that you want to be doing. <laughs> and so, uh, those, those people are often hard to like make friends with, you know? So it's like, mm -hmm. so you got to pay them sometimes. <laughs> and, uh, and, uh, yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm a huge, I spent, I've spent, I don't even know how much money I've spent on coaching over the years. I spent a lot of money on coaching and, uh, I really, I really truly believe in the power of it. And it's just, it's just because, well, one is you get it by osmosis. 
It's like, if you're, you know, if you're making 10 K a month and you want to make 40 K a month, then it's like, it's like, you got to be around people that are making 40 K a month. Right. <laughs> so uh, just because even if they don't tell you anything, you're just going to see just the way they carry themselves, their sense of confidence, whatever it may be. I remember I, I signed up for a coach recently and, and, um, I'm in this coaching, coaching group for coaches and, and, uh, this guy was doing what I was doing and he was making way more money than I am. And so uh, I got on a call with him just to pick his brain, thinking he was going to give me some free advice because uh, uh, we we're in the same group together. <laughs> he's like, "No, what you need is to sign up with my coaching." And he's basically he basically coaches people on everything that I coach people on, but he just charges five times as much. <laughs> and I'm like, "Oh wow, like that's interesting." Just that one realization that I had by s signing up with this guy was like, "Oh, I can do exactly what he's doing." And so it, it created this internal confidence shift, which is similar to what you're talking about. And that was all, that was worth the, all the money I paid him. Right. And so like, sometimes just that is, is all that's needed. Let, let, let's shift gears and talk about like the clients, you know, because what, what, what's the age range? Is it mostly younger girls or is it like, cause I don't really know much about pageantry. Like you're telling me about these, these women that are doing pageants that are older. I didn't even know that existed. Right. And so, so what is the typical age range of your client? Mm -hmm. So there's no age limit to pageantry. There is a pageant yeah. somewhere out there for every single person. And my age range is really, I would say 20 to 35, but I also have a 53 year old ball of fire who is one of my clients, like my favorite people in the world, but mostly what we call like the miss to misses age category. So it's these women who have likely already gone through their education. They already have their path set. So they think, and they're ready to try out pageants or they've been doing pageants for several years and they want to take their mission their brand, their name to a different level, to a different level of impact, fulfillment for themselves as well. And so I find that that awareness and that work that I do as a coach, you don't really get that same input and output when it's someone who's, you know, 16, who's going through the motions in high school. I have worked with some teenagers, but I just find that I love working with the women in the 20s to 30s age range so much more. So those are the women that I work with both, again, in Canada and around the world. Yeah. And so if you had to sum it up, like, what do you think the one thing is that most of these people struggle with? Because this is a, something I'm interested in because like, I, you know, I have my clients and, and I, I recognize that with all of the clients that I've coached over all of the years now is like, I can pretty much wrap up everybody's problems into a, like about a bag of like four or five things, you know, and most, most of it, if, if I had to sum up my clients, most of it is a recognition around the pain that you're avoiding, you know, like the, the not even understanding that that pain is still there. Um, and then learning how to, how to connect to it and let it go. Essentially. That's why I call myself the letting go coach. Um, so like, that's what I would, that's what I would think that my one thing is, is, is people's behaviors that they feel are, they're not serving them that are blocking them from maximizing their potential. And they can't figure out how to get out of that cycle. Um, my, my thing is to show them well, why they're in the cycle in the first place. Right. And you, you got to experience a little bit of, of what I do there and kind of like understanding that process. What do you think it is for you if you had to sum up your clients? Like, what is the thing, you know? And, and I don't want to sum it down because obviously it's so much more than one thing, but there's always like an underlying theme. Yeah, these two themes umbrella, I would say 99% of the issues that the women who come to me end up having. The first is why you? I just ask them a question. Why you? Why should you win? Why are you the one to do this when there are sometimes 50 100 other women up there and that requires you to again do that look in the mirror why me what do i think is special and there's no special answer to this by the way it's very simple in how you can say it in your own personal way but it's about seeing yourself as special as unique as the one that most women don't and so they'll default to saying something like i'm gonna do amazing things with this title i'm like well that's great that's what you just get to do. Yeah. What it, does that look like for you? And how is that different from everybody else? And it really takes them back. Again, you have to look and think, well, what am I doing? Why do I want this? Why me? Which takes them sometimes to a dark place where women don't feel special. They're going through the motions, but they haven't really owned their piece in this entire puzzle. So that's one thing. Why you? And the second part, which kind of has to do more with the pageant competitive impact side, is what do you stand for? Because the two things that nobody else can replicate, and I can say this, I've had a lot of women try and replicate the things they do, the outfits that I've purchased, and it's totally okay, but nobody can replicate my why, my story, the why me, and nobody can replicate the community service that I've done and what I'm going to continue to do 
with that title. You can use the same names that I use. You can use the same events that I've done, but the impact and the continuation, because it's not just one goal I do one time. It's something that I want to keep doing when I'm 50, whether or not I have the crown mm-hmm. is something that is so clear and so strong that I literally paint a vision for my judges, why I'm there and what I'm going to do. And when they see it that clearly that they could have recited it to me, they go, okay, Maria's the one, like she knows why her and she has a clear plan. That's something a lot of women don't do. They go in with these fluffy, vague phrases because they don't actually own why them and they don't have a plan for what they will do. And that also probably comes from not owning being the one, not knowing what you stand for and what you care about in the world. And I'm just a huge proponent that it's not about the crown. I'm going to stand for something I care about now. And, you know, whether it's before it had to do more with self-care, now it's about helping women become sisters with one another and celebrate and creating more spaces of community with women in Canada. That's now my huge focus. I'm going to do that whether or not I win. I'm going to do that whether or not I win have 12 months with this crown and then the crown goes on, I'm still going to do that. A lot of women don't do that. They will either do it for the crown, do it for 12 months and they disappear. And so women really do look at me and they go, Maria's not like, if I'm going to work with Maria, I've got to be someone who has a long-term vision and who's not doing this for just 12 months. And that requires you to fall in love with the things that you're doing. Because if you fall in love with it, you're going to keep doing it. You're not just going to stop. And or it might pivot, but you're not just going to give up or quit if it doesn't happen the first time. So knowing why you and what you stand for, especially in pageantry, I'm sure that might relate in life. But those are the two big things that we work on together. Yeah, I love that. It's so similar to like kind of what what I do. And so it's like I created this this little slogan for myself a long time ago that I have no desire to retire. Mm -hmm. And, And I think that that should ring true for anyone that is doing the thing that they do, like they're doing that they love is because if you're doing what you love, you never stop. And so it was like, if you're doing anything with an end goal in mind, whether it's winning a crown or working until you can retire or whatever that may be, it's like you're misaligned, right? And so that doesn't mean that you have to stop doing the thing you're doing, but you just have to get into alignment and learn how to love it, right? And so um, I love that. It's like, getting beyond that i think also what happening is when you you're getting when you're getting them to paint a picture for the judges in order for them to do that they have to paint that picture for themselves first yeah. right and so when they get connected to like how this is going to be something that they're going to do lifelong and they're going to love then it's it's like they're, they're, you don't even have to like plan out what you're going to say it's just so natural like like all the all the the workshops and stuff that I have, like, I don't have any notes. I just, I, I do every podcast with pretty much zero preparation, which maybe I could do a little bit, more. <laughs> but like, but pretty much zero preparation. And I just trust that, Hey, from the things that I've learned in my life, and it's all because it comes from this sense of knowing and this experience that I have that usually the conversations are going to go where they need to go. And they always do. Right. Mm-hmm. And so like, if you get somebody aligned with that, there, you don't need, you don't need to prep. You don't need to do anything. It's just like, cause they believe it. And so I guess, you know, the theme of everything that we've talked about here is like belief Mm -hmm. and learning how to get aligned and connected to that belief. And a part of that comes from breaking down like the, I like the the question, like why you, you know, like I'm just trying to, I'm just trying to think about like that, like people could take away those two things like for their lives. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like, think about the goal that you want to achieve, whatever that may be, whatever, wherever you want to, it doesn't, it could be anything. It's like, I'm just saying, it's like, you want to live a life of where you only work three days a week, you make all the money you need. Um, you know, you golf, golf two days a week is then ask yourself, well, why you like, why is it going to be? And this is something I've been aligning with lately is that the mind will, will, will spew out all the answers for you. Right. And, but if you don't ask these critical questions, right. And that's, I think that's the power of coaching too. And, um, and maybe like a different, a little bit different from therapy, not that I'm ripping on therapy. I think it's all great, but it's like a coach is like a little bit more likely to kind of like call you out on your bullshit, you know? Wow. And so, uh, because we're not, uh, you know, like the thing that therapists have is that they have like a, uh, they have like, um, like a code of mind. Yeah. Right. And that they have to follow. And if they don't, they'll get to shit. Like, you know, look what happened with Peterson and stuff. And so, uh, whereas coaches, we don't have that code. And, and, uh, and so I know a lot of therapists that get pissed about that, but the fact of the matter is, is that because we don't have that, we can just go from a place of integrity and honesty and, and, and call people out and sometimes that's like like that's the thing that's needed most is for you know to pull people outside of their jar to be like look at 
you're you're trapped in self doubt. They didn't they didn't see that label that they were wearing, you know. And so I'm guessing that's what you're probably doing for these women that are coming to you. And it's like, mm-hmm. and it's probably translating into like just changing their life all over, like not just in pageants, uh, as my guess. Yeah, absolutely. So it's funny. My 53 year old client messaged me today saying that it's the last day at her job because she's making a career change. Because once you have this new sense of self worth, almost. Mm-hmm. You just don't want to settle for mediocrity and average in any area of your life. So she's making a huge career change. It's not uncommon for my clients to change jobs, to change what their major is in their education, to leave relationships that just didn't serve them, and to just, in general, honestly, make more money. Because when you have this connection to who you are and your uniqueness, and even just the way you show up in interviews and in professional settings, people see you a different way you see yourself a different way and you're just more willing to ask for the things that you desire not even that you deserve you deserve everything but that you desire and because of this new sense of conviction and faith within you things just start to happen in every single area so it's it's twofold and that's why having a coach is so beneficial because you don't have to go through those difficult life things alone so whether you're leaving a relationship you have someone to support you through that so you're not going back if you're changing jobs, which again, my client's doing today, she's in a coaching space with us for the next three months where she gets to navigate if any feelings of fear or failure or you know maybe rejection from jobs that she's going to be applying to come up. She knows that she has the space of coaching to lean on to support her and saying, you're making the right decision for you. You're not doing this for us. This doesn't affect us. This is about you. And that's why I love coaching spaces and why I have no desire to be out of them because I want to be supported. It's Coaching is a you can almost think of it as an insurance policy. It's not just, you know, be with me when things are good. It's when I'm bad, let me lean in for support so I can make sure I get to the good place as soon as I can, essentially. Yeah. So good. Mm -hmm. Definitely. Um, So because this is obviously just not just a podcast about pageantry and Mm -hmm. being a pageant coach, there's so much more in it. I think uh, Zach will have to put some sort of like thing here, a clip in there. It's like, Mm -hmm don't get turned off because it's about pageants because there's it, it it's just so much more than pageants and 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 this your whole process of of becoming what you became is just like it's it's such a great guide for anyone looking to like make a, a change and a leap you know into into some sort of in some sort of direction so you know what let's just let's just kind of like wrap it up with this is if, if, if somebody's at home right now you know and recognizing kind of what you recognize in that photo. I'm not saying that they're going to go do pageants, but like they had some sort of awareness, you know, that they're miserable, that the, their life, they, they can't continue on this, this cycle. Like when, you know, trying to fix it is this like, is it, they've been trying to fix it their whole entire life and whatever it is that they're doing is just not working. So they're, and now, now they have that critical awareness that something major needs to shift. That was the awareness that you had, right? I was like, so what, what would you, what would, what advice would you offer to them at that point? I would tell them, and this will depend on who's listening, but I would say if you were already the queen or the king of your life, what would that look like? And think about kings and queens as royalty. Like they truly have everything they want at their fingertips. They can, you know, live in a castle. They can have people working for them or they can be doing community things. Like they just have this sense of royalty, of opportunity, of overflow and abundance. It's like if you looked at yourself as the queen or the king of your life, what would be really fun and exciting to do? What would you get to do each and every day? That would be not something that other people had to tell you, but something that you just selfishly said, I love doing this, wearing this, being this way. I'm going to be more of this on purpose and start intentionally choosing that part of you, that identity, that action or thing, whatever it is that you love, as long as it, of course, doesn't hurt anybody else in the process start doing that intentionally every single day. Mm -hmm. Start falling in love with the life that you have right now and treating yourself as that royalty that you already are. Yeah. And I think, I think the only thing I'll add to that is that once you answer that question, you're going to get aligned with an intention just like you did, which was an intention to, to look within and go deeper. And so once you align with that intention of, you know, what your life looks like as a king or queen, then, uh, you'll just be pulled by that intention. So it's just, it's just like creating like a North star essentially. And I think, yeah, that, that's great. I'm assuming that's a coaching tactic that you use. Yeah. You, actually, like, you like really had that that answer like <laughs> ready. <laughs> well, I've recently just this year started reflecting on how can I help people outside of pageants do yeah. this? Because a client of mine came to me. She We used to do personal training together. And she said, 
you know, I, I'm kind of interested in competing at pageant only because she knows that I do them. But she's like, can you help me do this even if it's not through pageantry? And the answer is absolutely yes. Yeah. The process is the same. We don't need to have the pageant in sight. But so I actually have a program called the Queen of Your Life program that helps women do that. Align your mindset, your energy and identity with what does it look like to be the queen of your life? Because I understand not everyone wants to compete in a pageant and that's totally OK. Yeah. But what does that look like for you and how can we help you do that in your own way? You should do a one day out at Lingo Vida. Um, that's why I went to the one day oh, retreat really? that's yeah. been scoping it out. Maybe we could yeah. talk a little bit about yeah. that. But I was thinking about hosting uh, an in-person event 2024. My intention is actually to host in-person events to help women not only in pageantry, but become the queen of their life. I love that title. We're doing a, we're doing one out yeah. there on the 24th called Wild Women. And mm -hmm. my friend Nina is putting on, she's so awesome. And, and it's getting like, I'll just, just because the title and that, I feel like that become the queen of your life also has like got a great title to it. So mm -hmm. I think people would be really, really attracted to that. So yeah, let's, let's talk about that. Yeah. Man. It's coming soon, 2024. Mm -hmm. uh, anyways, Maria, this has been like a really great conversation. I, and you know what? I, when we met out at Lungo Vida, I was like, eh, I know, I know we're going to have a good conversation and probably end up doing some more stuff together because we're in the similar space, you know? And uh, it's just, I, I just love talking to coaches because I feel like they have so much awareness and, and also, um, they get exposed to so so many other people's limitations that it creates more awareness around just limitations in general that maybe your own limitations as you hear a client you're like oh that might be mine too <laughs> right and so um it's just that coaches usually have this great sense of like stepping back and seeing everything so that's why i knew when i heard you were a coach i'm like oh yeah you got to get you on the podcast and it turned out to be a great conversation so thanks for taking the time to come on thank you i'm happy yeah. to be here where can people uh, find you like, you can find me yeah. online, Facebook, Instagram, TikTok, at The Pageant Gal. We've got a growing community collectively of over 100,000 across our wow. socials. So happy to have you all there. And if you even if you don't want to stay for the pageant content, stay for the mindset work and the things that I get to share, because that alone in itself will help change your own mindset and your own perspective on life. Awesome. Thanks again for coming. Thank you. Uh, thanks for listening to the podcast, guys. If you got any value whatsoever for this, all I ask is that you share it and click that subscribe button. And we'll see you guys again next week.